Okay, guys, we're going to... I'm hoping this is going to work. This laptop is acting a little funny. We'll figure it out. We're going to record and we're going to see what happens. Hopefully the sound comes out good. I, I, I thought I think I have everything set. So let's see what happens here. Okay, so this is going to be the first video in the uh, Revelation series of the letters of Jesus to the church. We're only going to focus on the letters. We're going to do one letter every Friday. Um, it'll all be at the same time, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, and we're going to dig into them and find out what's being said, look at some references. You know, it won't be exhaustive. I can't cover every single thing in a video, but at least it'll get it, dig into the details a little bit more and maybe inspire you to uh, step into these and do your own research on them. So we're going to start in Chapter 1. The letters start in Chapter 2. We're going to start in Chapter 1. Let me make sure I'm still recording. Am I still recording? Yes, okay. This thing's acting was acting funny a minute ago, so we'll see. Okay, so in uh, chapter 1, we're going to start all the way down here to verse 17. Uh, and this is just going to be like the setup for the letters. And when I saw him, him being Jesus, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So he's, he, he ha wants him to write down what happened, what is currently happening, or sorry, what has happened, what is currently happening, and what will happen. So that gives you the, the layout of this book, and how, how these, those, everything in this book fits in these categories. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So each church has an assigned angel. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. The lampstands are the churches. Now, these references can be used elsewhere. In this particular case, I'm just going to throw a loose mention out there. When you look up the two witnesses, these are the two... These, these are my two olive trees, my two golden lampstands. You come back here and look at these lampstands and then go look at those, you see something very interesting. But that's for a different video. I've covered it before, but that's for a different video. Uh, the two witnesses, I don't think, are what people think they are. Anyway, if, if what I'm seeing in there is correct, according to the scriptures, then it's two groups of people, not two people. But that's a, like I said, that's a different video. Now, today's video is going to be Revelation 2.1. To Revelation 2 7. We're only going to cover seven verses. It's going to be to the church in Ephesus. Now, my goal here is to look and see what all we can find involving each individual church and look at it throughout history. So let's read the scriptures first and then we'll dig a little deeper into this. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. So they even had false apostles back then, just like we do today now. There are no apostles today, guys. There are none. I know a lot of people make excuses about capital A, lowercase a, and the different roles they play. There are no apostles today. There are no prophets today. So far, there is nobody who's given a prophecy that hasn't been found to be wrong. They may be right on a couple of things, but how generic is the prophecy? You know, you're supposed to be able to give specifics and then come out accurate. Well, so far, nobody's been able to pull that off. Verse 3, and you have preserved and have patience. You notice, you notice he mentioned patience twice. And have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, so this is a perfect church. They've done everything great. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have. So I have this against you. You, you were doing all these things great, but I have this against you. But now, but this you have, 
that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans were not very nice people. We'll, we'll take a look at that. He who has an ear, and this is a very, these are the most important statements in these letters. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That's the, that's the tree that bears all manner of fruit and the leaves of the healing of the nations, where the book of Revelation talks about that. This laptop is acting up. I hope I can get to this video without it messing up too much. Okay, so the first thing to do, let's go look at the Nicolaitans. Who are they? Um, Blunt, and I don't know who that is, it's some, some guy, but holds that the Nicolaitans either believed that the command against ritual sex was part of the Mosaic Law from which they had been freed by Jesus Christ, and it was uh, licit for them, not illicit, but licit, or that they went too far during Christian love feasts. They actually had some issues. Now, remember, Paul had dealt with that. You guys get drunk, you're doing things that even the unbelievers don't do. Okay, so we're going to go to questions real quick. Just take a little bit of, look a little bit of information. <clears throat> the exact origin of the Nicolaitans is unclear. Some Bible commentators believe they were a heretical sect who followed the teachings of Nicholas, whose name means one who conquers the people, who was possibly one of the deacons of the early church mentioned in Acts 6.5. It is possible that Nicholas became an apostate, denying the true faith, and became part of the group holding the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Israel to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols, by, the, by, the, by committing sexual immorality. Clement of Alexandria says they abandoned themselves to pleasure like goats. That's a bad thing. Leading a life of self-indulgence. Their teaching perverted grace and replaced liberty with license. So in other words, they gave you license to sin. Other commentators believe that these Nicolaitans were not so called from any man, but from the Greek word Nicola, meaning let us eat, as they often encouraged each other to eat things offered to idols. Whichever theory is true, it is certain that the deeds of the Nicolaitans were an abomination to Christ. They, like the Gnostics and other false teachers, abused the doctrine of grace and tried to introduce uh, licentiousness in its place. And that was from 2 Peter 2.15, 19, and Jude 1.4. Now this keeps going. Just a little bit more here. Let's go ahead and, and read the rest of it since it's short. Jesus commends the church of Ephesus, since we're covering Ephesus, this is perfect, for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans, as he does, Revelation 2.6. No doubt the leaders of the Ephesian church protected their flock from these destructive heresies and kept their people from committing the same evil deeds. All sin is hateful to Christ, as it should be to his followers. As we hate men's evil deeds, not the men themselves, for the church at Pergamos, Jesus had not had not uh, commendation, but censure. Unlike the Ephesians, they actually embraced the teachings of the Nicolaitans, Revelation 2.15. We'll get into that next Friday. Jesus warns them that unless they repent, they are in danger of the judgment that is sure to fall on, on those who teach false doctrine. There's a judgment for all the people teaching false doctrine. Attack his church and destroy his people. The sword of judgment is poised over their heads, and his patience is not limitless. Revelation 2.16 and 9.15 The lesson for us is that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the ages has been plagued by those of the Nicolaitan spirit. The only way to recognize false teaching is to be intimately familiar with truth through the diligent study of the word of God. I 100% agree. Of all things, we should be paying very close attention to what the word of God says. Okay, so we got that out of the way. Now let's go back up to the beginning here. To the angel of the church of Ephesus. Now, I find that interesting. He's not saying don't write to the church of Ephesus. What does that imply? Well, the church of Ephesus no longer exists. Hasn't existed for, you know, almost 2,000 years. It, it disappeared a long, long time ago. But the angel is still present because the mentality of this church 
is still present in mankind. The church of Ephesus, even though that was a physical church, was an example. It was an example of an, a mindset, an ideology. Look at how this reads, how this letter reads. These are all ideologies that they have as, as how they're interacting and acting out their lives at that time. That mentality, that way of thinking has passed down the generations. You know, teachings passed down the generations. This has passed down the generations. And what they have done is people throughout the world who claim they believe have taken on these, these ideologies, taken on this way of thinking, and they continue to do it to this very day. Let me go, since we're on that subject, let me go here. Um, trying to think of how I want to poise this. The churches in Revelation throughout history. Let's see. Why do I need that? Let's sign up. So here's a question on Korah, and I think this may direct me where I'm trying to go here. Because you can look at history the last 2,000 years and see these mentalities um, omnipresent in the church as the church grew. Let's see. Quickly, let me see. This may not. Oh, here we go. There's some some of it here. Um, thirdly, we have the historic viewpoint of these churches. Very briefly, they are considered to fill the following times, saying that they are going to overlap into the next one or the previous one. Ephesus, they call that the Apostolic Age from its inception to 167 A.D. Smyrna, the martyrdom of the church from 167 to 316 A.D. Pergamus, the Roman occupation of the church from 316 to 500 A.D. Thyatira, Roman supremacy in the church, 440 to 1500 A.D. So that brings us, it brings it all the way up to just 500 years ago, uh, give or take. So it's interesting that you can look at the, the, the mentality of these different churches carried through um, the church age in different time frames. And so the further along you get, you start to see the other churches pop up too. This is only four of them. While the first four churches can be identified by certain time periods and actions, the same can't be said for the last three. They all appear to start with the Great Reformation in the early 1500s. That would have been Pink, uh, Wycliffe, Spurgeon, all them guys. They all fall into that category. And go concurrently to the end of the church age. Throughout the years, there have been churches who have filled the outlined of at least one of the three churches. The encouraging aspect is that while there is failure in one place, God is working mightily in other places. It's not for us to try to decide where God can work. We are to be servants and not get in the way, and then we can appreciate seeing a sovereign God at work. And this is interesting because if you look over the last, let's see, where did they stop? Thyatira? If you look over the last 2,000 years, you see the church as a whole falling into these categories. So the last three that they said they couldn't identify was Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Look at the church today, the quote-unquote church as a whole. You see these three churches fitting into this, it, all of us fitting into the category of these three churches. Sardis. The church, to all appearances, looked very satisfactory. Bingo. They, uh, those around saw a church that appears to be full of life. Yet as God viewed it, the church was dead. Yet amidst the ashes of the fire, God saw few live embers. His desire was that the flame of love and service for him be lit again. John condemned them for having garments stained with filth of the world. They were a worldly church. They were carnal church. They lost the holy lives God in, uh, desires his people to live. In scripture, our garments speak of our character. God promised that it, 
in eternity, there is not going to be one stain on our garments. Every stain is covered by the blood shed on Calvary. Philadelphia. This church was known for their gospel testimony, faithfulness to God and his word. So, as I'm reading these, think about if that sounds like anything you've seen today. In the end, this is what makes everything worthwhile. In eternity, God promised that he would eternally be identified with them. A pillar in the temple plays an essential role in maintaining the structure. God, by writing his name on us, places his stamp of ownership on us. We are his and our worship and service are preserved in him alone. Laodicea. This was the self-sufficient church. They thought they had everything under control. They needed help, guidance, or assistance from no one. However, as God saw them, they are utterly destitute. There is nothing about them that pleased God. And he looked on them, there, or as he looked on them, there were none he could fellowship with. His love and desire for his people are displayed in verse 20. His knocking on the door told that, verse 7, he will not force himself on us, but that he will never leave his people alone. John chapter 10 tells us that uh, only his own can hear his voice. If we seek friendship with him, he will come into the most intimate place of fellowship right in the home of our hearts. So it's very interesting that you see this in these three in the church today. Now, even funnier is you see all of them. And so one of the points of going through these letters is we can see aspects of this happening in the church today. And so let's see if we can identify any of that. Okay. I know your works, verse 2, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. That's literally happening today. There are people today calling themselves apostles. Some have pulled back from that because they realized that the scriptures that they were using to prove that didn't actually prove it. And so to keep people happy, they pulled back from that. They still consider themselves part of that category. The thing is, they don't do anything. I, I, I've, I've watched a few videos. There's even some women calling themselves apostles. No, not happening. But it's interesting that they, they think they're right, yet everything they do goes directly against what the Bible says. So literally, the church of Ephesus, we have aspects of that today. Found them out to be, they found them out to be liars. That, that's, that's today. That's happening today. Because those people, when you test them, they're liars. There's nothing about them that, that's ap apostolic at all. They don't have the power to heal. They don't have the power of tongue. They don't have nothing. The only thing they have is $1,000 suits and $100,000 cars <laughs> and million-dollar homes. Yeah, that's not, that's not an apostle. Um, then he says, And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. So it's a church that was dedicated. This is a church that stuck to their guns. They, they dug in and they went forward. They're like, okay, this is what it says, this is what we're doing. And, and they hung on. The problem is, they did all this great. This is all good stuff. But then, Jesus had something against them. They made a mistake. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. What would be their first love? So let's go in here and let's look at the original language. Oops. So, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou has left thy first love. So what is the first? Protos. Contracted superlative of G4253. Foremost in time, place, order, or importance. Before, beginning, best, chiefest, first of all, former. So they started out great, but then left that thing they did at the beginning. What would have been their love? It's... Um, Agape. So it's uh, because Jesus, remember Jesus was talking to Peter and he talked about the different kinds of love. Phileo, agape. This is agape love. That is affection and benevolence. Specifically plural, a love feast. Feast of charity, dear love. Now, there may be a reason why they did this. Because, remember, the Nicolaitans actually were creating an issue with this and they hated that it may have been they have got they got offended and walked away from these things so what would be considered a first love the uh, communion doing communion and remembering the lord and honoring the lord 
that could be considered a first low. Uh, doing the things they used to do at the beginning. So let's go back here. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. So what this, whatever this was, this first love they had, they fell hardcore from it. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. This is serious. Whatever this first love is, is a serious thing because they haven't, that the Lord is going to take their lampstand away if they don't change. Now, they're good on all this other stuff. But this one thing, this first love, but what would be a first love? Worship, prayer, um, the Lord's Supper, um, giving to others, uh, helping others. You know, these are all first love. These are all things we started out at first. We were fi on fire for the Lord. It could be that they weren't on fire for the Lord that much anymore. They were just kind of going through the motions. They were doing it right, but there was no love left in it. Love is important. Love is cornerstone in belief. But this you have. That you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I think, just by looking at this, it may have been. They weren't honoring the Lord's Supper anymore. Maybe they put a stop to it because of the Nicolaitans. See, the Nicolaitans would sneak into churches. And they would do the things that they wanted to do. So they would go. They, they had these big rooms where they would go and they would sit and do the Lord's Supper. And it was a it was an event. Everybody got together for this. And it, was, it took a, 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 a decent amount of time. My care is about to fall over. So it may have been that these people were going and they were they were getting rooms adjacent to this and they were partying, hooping and hollering and having orgies because the, the sex was one of the big things and they were they were gorging themselves. It may have been the Church of Ephesus got upset at this, got offended at this because the Lord made sure to point out that they hated this stuff and they so they put a stop to it. Jesus may have been, okay, look, guys, I want you to go back to this. I know you hate these guys and hate what they do. I do, too. Go back to what your first love was. Go back and do the things you did at the beginning. Because there's another church that also, you know, return to the first works. The first things you used to do. That would be the things I mentioned. But here, he gives a clue. It, it may have been they got offended at these Nicolaitans. They got offended at what they were doing, and they were like, okay, we can't have this anymore, guys. we got to put a stop to it. But what they ended up doing was they ended up stopping something that they should have kept doing. Something that was actually very important. We don't know for sure because we weren't there. But we can get some clues out of what the text says. The, the text is, is going to give us little, bit, little bits of evidence to show what may have happened. And like I just mentioned, it may have been they got offended at this and stopped doing the love feasts. Stop doing the, the some of the first things that they were doing that they were really happy with. These guys ruined it. Now, why they didn't just put them out of the church, I don't know. Maybe they couldn't identify them. But it, there was obviously some issues going on. But everything was good except for that one thing. You've left your first love. So what would, the, what would a first love be? Let's see if we can find anything. What is the meaning of first love in the Bible? Love is the basic law of the kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus Christ summarized it this way. The first love is your love for God. Interesting. Let's try got questions see what they got to say. Revelation 21, or sorry, Revelation 2, 1 through 7, which is what we're covering today, contains Jesus' message to the church of Ephesus. The first of seven exhortations to various churches in the Roman Empire. Ephesus had some unique challenges for a Christ follower in that it was home to the emperor's cult and the worship of the Greek goddess Artemis. Acts 19, 23, 40. Because of these influences, the Ephesian believers had developed great discernment when it came to false teachers and heresy. Christ commended them for this discernment, but he faulted them for having lost their first love. The first love which characterized the Ephesians was the zeal and ardor with which they embraced their salvation as they realized they loved Christ because he first loved them, 1 John 4, 19. And that it was, in fact, his love for them. Pop-ups, always pop-ups. Um, and it was, in fact, his first, or his love for them 
that had made them alive together with Christ. So overwhelmed were they by the joy that came from understanding their former state, dead in trespasses and sins, and their new life in Christ, that they exhibited the fruit of that joy. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. Because of God's great love for the Ephesians, they were made alive in Christ, and that new life was exhibited in the passion of gratitude. Thanksgiving is a key thing in our lives. That passion for the Savior spilled over onto one another and out to those in the culture they inhabited, corrupt as it was. Jesus commends the Ephesians for their many good works and hard work. They tested teachers to see whether their professions were real. They endured hardship and persevered without growing weary. But they had lost their warmth and zeal for Christ. Remember who else? What other church had a problem with their warmth? They were hot nor cold, they were lukewarm. See, this is a key thing in the church today. This is a very important thing in the church today. <clears throat> and when that happened, they began to go through the motions of good works. It was a job. It wasn't something done out of love. Motivated not by love of and for Christ, but by the works themselves. What was once a love relationship cooled into a mere religion. Their passion for him became little more than cold orthodoxy. It was just... It was just, these are just things we did. It wasn't for the love of the Lord that they did them. Surrounded by paganism and false teachers, which, again, goes back to what I told you, it may have been they got offended by this, and it was, it was, it was bringing them down. Surrounded by paganism and false teachers, the Ephesian church would have had ample opportunity to correct false doctrine and confront heretical teachers. If they did, if they did so for any reason other than love for Christ and a passion for his truth, much like what we do today, a love for the word, standing up for truth. But there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. A lot of people do it the wrong way. Don't attack the brethren for that. Just do it, do it correctly. However, they would have lost their way. Instead of pursuing Christ with the devotion they once showed, much like a bride who follows her groom through the desert, Jeremiah 2.2, 2, the Ephesians were in danger of falling away from Christ completely. They were rock solid, but that one thing, was about to separate them. That's why he was so stern with them. Hey, y'all better repent, or I'm going to take your lampstand away. It's, it was a big deal. This is why he warns those who have ears to hear to prove the reality of their salvation. Prove the reality of their salvation. What have I been telling you guys? Go to the Lord with this. Ask him, Lord, I need to know. By returning to him and rekindling the love that had begun to cool, no doubt... There were among the Ephesians those whose profession was false and whose hearing had become dulled. He warns the rest not to follow them, but to repent and return to him with the passion they once had for him. We face the same challenges in the 21st century. There are few churches that aren't subject to and in danger of a certain amount of false teaching. That's everywhere. That's why the brick-and-mortar church has lost its draw to believing Christians today. A lot of people are saying, find a good church, find a good church. It's hard. It's really hard. The online ministry has gone through the roof because it's so hard to find a church. In fact, Jen Markell, a bunch of years ago, talked about a gal who had messaged her and told her she moved to three, she was over um, in Europe. She moved to three different countries to find a church. She moved to another country to find a church and finally found one. Um, but Jesus calls us to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15. And to not let the frustration of false teaching overpower the love of Christ in us. Ephesians 4, 31-32. Don't let those people see what happened. If you guys remember, some of y'all remember what happened to me in the in the gospel, the quote-unquote uh, grace community. And uh, I didn't let that stop me. I, I At first I was thinking about it, but I didn't let that stop me. Because what they were doing, for the most part, not all of them, but for the most part, as a group, what they were doing was wrong. And the Bible made that clear, and they wouldn't listen to reason on this. And so I had to break away. I didn't let that stop me. i got to keep going. I'm not going to let anybody who's a false teacher, hater of the brethren, accuser of the brethren, I'm not going to let them stop me. The Lord gave me this, and I have to keep doing this. And I have to keep doing it with zeal. This is what he, exactly what he's talking about in this church here. Stand up for what's right. It may have been that at Ephesus, they hated what the Nicolaitans were doing, but they wouldn't do anything about it. In addition to coming against what you know is wrong it's important to address it also but like he said you speak the truth in love now that doesn't mean you hold back from them or you kowtow to them you stand up and say hey you know what the word says and it doesn't say what you're doing 
stop doing that. If not, get out of our church. You've got to be zealous. They're going to call you a zealot. Tell them thank you. But this is what the Lord wanted them to do. He wanted them to be zealous. And to not let the frustration of false teaching overpower the love of Christ in us. Our first love is the love Christ gives us for God and each other. We should be zealous for the truth, but that zeal should be tempered so that we are always speaking the truth in love. We will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ, Ephesians 4.15. So you can see what the, the, the clue here is. They had a problem with all this stuff that was going on around them. The, the false apostles, I imagine there was, I well, guarantee there was false prophets, false teachers, the Nicolaitans and the nonsense they were doing. They literally, all these people were ruining what they had going on, which they loved. They loved it, and they loved being around each other. But all this other stuff was ruining it. Instead of them responding to it, they were letting all this stuff push them down and suppress them. They were coming down and, and drawing in and saying, I don't even want to go to this church anymore, and they would stay home. It's a lesson for us today. We can't let that happen. What they should have done, and this is what the Lord is telling them to do, you know what the truth is. You know how these things go. In the beginning, you stood up for this and you told them, kick bricks. I don't want you guys here. Pound sand. We're not going to deal with this. But now you won't do that. You hate it, but you don't say anything. You don't stop them. You don't address it and say, hey, no, this is what the word says. If you're not going to do that, you need to go to the church. I want you all head down to, to Laodicea. They'll, they'll have you there. We don't want you here. This is what was going on with this church. They were doing great, but they wouldn't do the first thing. Because, you know, when we all first became a Christian, what was what was the first thing that we were, like, hardcore on? This is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is right, this is right, this is right. i got to push all this stuff away. What happens over time, over the years? We start to let some of that stuff back in. We start to allow some of those things. And so we need to be fired up every now and then to stand up and to put a stop to this stuff when it's appropriate. If we don't, even if we don't put a stop to it, at least say something. And it, it could be you need to go to the, the councils and say, hey, guys, this is a problem, and you need to really plead your case. Or if if it need be, you need to leave whatever church you're in. Okay, guys, I can't I can't go with this anymore. You guys know this is wrong. It's right here in the Word. You all are the ones that are leading the show. You know better, and, you're, and I'm trying to help reason with you about this with the Scripture, and you won't listen. So I, I, can't, I can't abide by this. And you may have to step away from that. It just sometimes it happens. But the most important thing is not to allow it, especially in your own personal life. Stand your ground on what you know to be true. Stand up for what's right. Stand up for the word of God. This is what their problem was. They hated these things, but they were allowing it. Notice in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. They hate them. I, I can't take it, guys. I can't take it. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not been weary. Notice nowhere in these seven verses does it say, we found them to be liars and put them out of the church. We found out that they were uh, bringing false teaching, and we sent them away. We got tired of what the Nicolaitans were doing, but we let them keep doing it. We didn't send them out. We didn't stop. put a stop to them. They were allowing this stuff to happen. Their, their problem was they were allowing these things to happen. They identified them. They knew what they were. They didn't like it, but they allowed it to happen. It's the church that didn't say anything. It's the church that didn't speak up and speak out. It's the church that just put their hands up and says, can't we all just get along? That's what's happening today when a church allows homosexuality in the church, when they allow transgenders in the church, when they allow gay marriage in the church. The first love would have been, no, we're not having that here. You're welcome to engage in worship with us, but if you've got those kind of issues going on, you need to deal with those things. Those are sins that you need to have to dealt, deal with with the Lord. You will not teach in this church. You will not have a position in this church. You will not bring this stuff into our church. And if you seek to do so, you're, you're, you're leaving. And that's the end of it. That's the first love. Stand your ground on what you know to be true. And don't allow them to have a foothold. And Ephesus wasn't doing that. Ephesus wasn't doing that. Ephesus, Ephesus was allowing those things. They hated them. They identified them. They, they were allowing them. 
Notice down here in verse 6, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Notice it doesn't say, but you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans and have put them out. Nowhere in here does he say that they dealt with this stuff. They identified it. They hated it, but they dealt with it. They never dealt with it. They never did anything with it. So this was the problem Jesus had. And so his, his cure was, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life. What is overcoming? We'll look at that. Which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Stand your ground. Don't. Don't get your lampstand removed. Don't get your lampstand removed. Now remember, this is to the church. The, the angel of the church. So the angel is having to work with all this stuff. Get rid of that stuff. Don't have that stuff. Now what is overcoming? Let's, let's dig into that a little bit. Uh, let's see. To him who overcometh. That is... Nikaho, to subdue, literally or figuratively. Conquer, overcome, prevail, get the victory. Overcome. Overcome what? Overcome evil. Overcome false apostles. Overcome liars. Overcome false teachers. Overcome the Nicolaitans. Overcome the thing holding us back from our first love. So that overcome refers to all Christians, but it's also specifically addressed to these guys. Overcome these things, guys. Now, you're going to see as we go through these letters, because I'm going to do a summarization video where we're going to go back through and just touch on some things. But you're going to see that over that word overcome is going to be specific to each church, but it's also going to be, here's the list of things you guys need to overcome in your lives as Christians. You'll see when we get to the last one. Now, overcome. What is overcoming? Well, first of all, it's overcoming those things they were dealing with. But so the definition of overcome this is from Oxford languages succeeding dealing with a problem or difficulty hello defeat an opponent and prevail of an emotion overpower and overwhelm so we're to overpower and overwhelm these things stopping us from our first love and from serving the Lord. That's what the Ephesians needed to do. To defeat the opponent. Who's the opponent? Sin. Our own selves. The devil and his boys. Succeeding dealing with a problem or difficulty. This is a key one. They didn't succeed in dealing with the Nicolaitans. They identified the false apostles, but didn't deal with them. They identified the liars, didn't deal with them. Identified the false teachers, but they didn't deal with them. That's the problem they had. Their first love would have been to deal with them. Let's see if got questions is on here. All right, doesn't look like it. We'll, we'll fix that. All right, what does the Bible say about being an overcomer? The Bible has a lot to say about being an overcomer. The term overcomer is especially prominent in the book of Revelation, where Jesus encourages his people to remain steadfast through trials. First um, John 5, this is important because um, John's writings, and I did a playlist on John, John's writings has a lot to say about this stuff. A lot, a lot to teach us. First John 5, 4 through 5 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? I'm going to read that again. For whatever is born of God, this is 1 John 5, 4-5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. How do you overcome the world? The trappings of the world don't influence you. You become a Christian in spite of those things. You overcome the everyday things that hold us down and slow us down. The fact that you have faith shows you're an overcomer. And this is what this says. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. The fact that you believe. It is a miracle, guys. You've heard me say this. It is a miracle that we can have faith in this day and age when literally everything in the world is designed to lead us away from God. It is a miracle we have faith. It is a testament to the work of God. 
So this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. The fact that you have faith is, sh uh, shows that you're an overcomer. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Overcomers are followers of Christ who successfully resist the power and temptation of the world system. An overcomer is not sinless, but holds fast to faith in Christ until the end. You don't have to be sinless to be an overcomer. You don't have to be sinless to be a Christian. A lot of people have that misconception today. He does not turn away when times get difficult or become an apostate. The Christian doesn't. He doesn't turn away. Overcoming requires complete dependence upon God for direction, purpose, fulfillment, and strength to follow his plan for our lives. And guys, just, just for reference, I'm going to link all this in the description. The Greek word most often translated overcomer stems from the word Nike, which is, according to Strong's importance, means to carry off the victory. The verb implies a battle. The Bible teaches Christians to recognize that the world is a battleground, not a playground. God does not leave us defenseless, though. Dis uh, Ephesians 6, 11-17 describes the armor of the Lord available to all believers. An armor you don't pray, an armor you live, by the way. Scattered throughout this narrative is the abomination, or sorry, the admonition to stand firm. Stand firm in what you know to be true. Sometimes all it takes to overcome temptation is to stand firm and refuse to be dragged into it. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. An overcomer is one who resists sin no matter what lures Satan uses. The Apostle Paul wrote eloquently of overcoming in Romans 8, 35-39. He summarizes the power believers have through the Holy Spirit to overcome any attacks of the enemies. Verse 37 says, In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Overcoming is often equated with enduring. Jesus encouraged those who followed him to endure to the end. Matthew 24, 13. A true disciple of Christ is one who endures through trials by the power of the Holy Spirit. An overcomer clings to Christ no matter how high the cost of discipleship. Hebrews 3.14 says, We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. That's important. What was wrong with Ephesus? They didn't hold their original conviction firmly to the very end. That's what Jesus was telling them to go back to. That's your first love, your original conviction. Go back to what you used to do. Go back to how you used to be and hold fast to that or I'm going to take your lampstand out of the way. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. Now, I, I think some of us today, and especially in the last five years, have come to an even greater conviction. Even more than our first love, we went even further into what, we, what our conviction is. What's our conviction? The Word of God. The truth of the Word of God. And we don't deviate from that. What do we see people doing today that, that are calling themselves Christians? Deviating from that very same thing. In the book of Revelation, Jesus promised great reward to those who overcome. Now, every letter we're going to read is going to have that statement to him who overcomes. Overcomers are promised that they will eat from the tree of life. That's 2-7. That's, uh, that's actually the ones we're reading. Be unharmed by the second death, 2.11. Eat from the, and this is all the revelation, hidden manna, and be given a new name, 2.17. Have authority over the nations, 2.26. Be clothed in white garments, 3.5. He made a permanent pillar in the house of God. Or be made a permanent pillar in the house of God, 3.12. And sit with Jesus on his throne, 3.21. That's all references from Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. We're going to read all those over the next few Fridays. Jesus warned that holding fast to him would not be easy. It would be well worth it. In Mark 13, 13, he says, You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. We have the guarantee of Jesus that we are his. We will be able to endure to the end, and his reward will make it all worthwhile. Guys, there's not much else to put here. Ephesus lost their first love. They were doing great. They were, they were right on the money, but they wouldn't do anything about what they had identified. They wouldn't do anything about the things that were wrong. They were letting it happen. They were complicit after the fact. Their first love would have been heavy conviction. Hey, no, that's not right. Because in the beginning, that's probably how they were. But then they were letting it happen. Jesus went and everybody, all the 
crooked people came out of the woodwork and were like, hey, we're going to church too and we're going to mess it up. And they did. They weren't calling them out on this stuff. Jesus told them, guys, go back to how you used to be. Get those Nicolaitans out of the church. Get those false apostles out of the church. You know who they are. Get the liars, the false teachers. Get them all out. They had patience in that they were enduring these things. They were persevering these things and didn't get weary, but they weren't doing anything about it. That was the problem. And so in order for them to overcome, they need to overcome those things. They need to get rid of them. They need to become the church they originally started as and stay that way. And Jesus' warning was, if you don't, repent. I'm going to take your lampstand. Repent of these things. Change. Change your mind. Do it the way you used to. Do it better. They were good, except for that. That was their one problem. And then Jesus closes this one with, and he's going to close all of them with this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And that is a that is a, a that is part of an inheritance. It's part of the inheritance to be able to eat from that tree. So what do we do here? What do we, what's our takeaway from this as we end this video? Takeaway is we know what right and wrong is. Let's do right. But not only do we hold ourselves accountable for our actions, we hold others accountable for their actions. So if we have somebody that is wrong, we point that out. Hey, wait a minute. That's not right. This is actually what it says. So what you're doing is incorrect. If they're doing it within our, our churches, we got to do something about it. we got to put them out. Now, you guys, me, we don't have that kind of authority. We do in Christ, but we don't have it in the church. But we can certainly say something about it. Hey, that's not right. We shouldn't be doing those things. I did that in my last church. I realized I was not going to be hit, getting any headway. I was not going to, to be any benefit because the, the pastor wasn't uh, open and receiving to that. Okay, time to move. I didn't have a choice because I was not going to be able to be any benefit there. Uh, I went on. I would love to find a church, but I'm kind of scared to go to one now. That may look negatively me, but the thing is, I'm not willing to let go of what I know is right. I personally am not willing to give in to this. False apostles, everybody today that calls themselves an apostle is a false apostle. Everybody today that calls themselves a prophet are proven wrong. They're false prophets. They won't admit it. They won't, they won't accept it. The people that are doing the things they shouldn't be doing in the churches, we've got to call it out. Homosexuality? Nope. Transgender? Nope. Women pastors? Nope. We've got to say no to all that stuff. We've got to stand our ground on what we know is right. This is the first love. The conviction of the truth. So for Ephesus, that was what their problem was. They needed to fix that. We see aspects of that today. We see aspects of that today. In my last church, it actually was kind of a thing. So we would do a potluck whenever it was the first, it was the first Sunday of every month, I think. We would do communion, and we'd do a potluck. So they would... Go through the we go to the sermon, we do communion, and everybody would rush over to the uh, fellowship hall, and everybody would sit down and they would gorge themselves on food. And I didn't see it personally, but I did hear conversations about things that people were talking about. And it's so funny because now that I think back on that, I saw some of this stuff right here happening in the, in those getting together. I didn't feel comfortable. There's a couple times I left. There's a couple of times I sat by myself. I didn't feel comfortable with it because there was, it, it, it was such, it was a gossip fest. It, it was all about how much food can we pack in ourselves. Um, and then when it was, when we were eating close, everybody took off. And so only a couple of people were left to clean up. I mean, it, literally I was seeing aspects of Ephesus in my last church. And it's terrible that that happens. I called it out a few times. I got pushed back immediately. I probably could have called it out more, and I'm going to sit there and I'm going to admit that I could have called it out more. I could have pointed it out more, but it just would have got me shoved out of that church quicker. Um, but, you know, we do what we can when we can. Here's the thing. As an individual, you stand up for what you know is right. If you see it happening in a group, you point it out. You say something, and you make sure that, guys, this is not right. And if they won't listen to reason and they're going to keep allowing that stuff, you've got to make a judgment call. You're going to make a judgment. You know what? I can't be a part of this, y'all. You're allowing sin in the group, I can't be a part of this. And you have to remove yourself from it sometimes. And it sucks because we love people. We love to fellowship with other Christians. We love to be around, but we can't allow this stuff. So this is the church of Ephesus. This, is, this was their problem. 
They, they deviated away from their first love, which was conviction of the truth. We can't do that today. That, here's our example. Don't do that today. That's what's happening today. They'll call truth lies and lies truth. They'll call good evil and evil good. Right, wrong, and wrong, right. That's what's happening. And so he's giving us a message. Watch out for these things, guys. Make sure you're doing what you know you're supposed to do concerning these things. Or there could be issues. A lot of Christians today are willing to make compromise. We can't, we can't make compromise. It's God's way or no way. It's the Bible or nothing. There, there is no other understanding. There is no other opinion. There is no other scripture. It is the Bible or nothing. If we can stand on that, we've overcome the nonsense of this world. Because what is the difference? A person standing on that or a person, well, I believe this, but I'm going to bring this other stuff in too. That's compromise. We can't compromise. Don't compromise. Don't go down this road. Church of Ephesus, we're doing great, except for that one thing. Let us take that as an example and not do that. All right, guys, that's the first letter. We're kicking this thing off here. Um, every Friday, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'm going to put up a video doing another letter, and we're going to keep digging just like we are. I'll post links and stuff of whatever we find in the descriptions of these videos as we go. And uh, it's not going to be exhaustive, but we're going to dig as deep as we can and find what we can because we need to learn about what's going on in here and see what we can take away from this. See what kind of message and example we can get from this. Uh, I think a lot of other, I would like to hear a lot of others dig deeper into these two uh, that are better than me at this and show some more stuff. But, um, yeah. So what I'll do, so the next Friday will be the Church of Smyrna. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to read this over here on the side. This is by F.B. Meyer, Revelation 2, 1-7, through 7, Renew Thy First Love. Each of these letters consists of three parts. One, the introduction, specifying some characteristics from the vision of the preceding chapter, which is appropriate to the need of the church addressed. Two, a description of the condition of the church. Th three, a promise to the overcomer. Following the successive revelations of God in the Old Testament, which begin with the tree of life and include the manna, the conquest of Canaan, the glory of the temple, and the reign of Solomon. We may go far in outward activities for the cause of the Redeemer and yet be threatened with the removal of our candlestick. Outward, outward expressions don't fill the bill. We can do it, we can do those activities, but we are in danger of getting that. Full of labor, opposed to wicked men and false teachers, persistently orthodox, not fainting in the day of trial. And yet, if love be wanting, important, what did Paul say? If I give my body to be burned, give away my stuff, sell all I have, give it to the poor, widows and everything, if I do all that and have not love, it's done me nothing. It's worthless. If love be wanting, nothing can compensate. Is the complaint true of us that we have lost our first love? And we have to ask ourselves this question. We can't deny it. The exuberance of its emotion may have passed with the years, but has it been replaced by a deep, all-constraining, and masterful devotion to our Lord? You're going to cool down a little bit, with, especially with age, but don't cool down that much. It is the Spirit's prerogative to shed abroad His love in our hearts and to teach us to love Him, but none of us can acquire that love without perpetually feeding on the tree of life, which is the emblem of Himself being Jesus. Genesis 2.9, Revelation 22.2, Revelation 22.14, and Revelation 22.19. Guys, that is all I got. I hope this was eye-opening. I kind of sped through it a little bit because I won't worry about this laptop. Hopefully it's going to keep going. Um, we'll see where we go from there. And I will see you all in the next video. Love you guys. And I'll talk to you later.